All right, I think we can get started. And people can trickle in as they do. Um, so, hello everyone, and welcome to the webinar on children and youth with special health care needs. My name is Deborah Fluck, and I am a research analyst at Child Trends. I am accompanied by my colleague Sadumo Abdi, who is also a research analyst at Child Trends. And we also have on the line David Murphy, a research fellow and director of the data bank at Child Trends, who will join our discussion and help answer questions we may have. Today, we'll be looking at how children and youth with special health care needs face challenges in accessing information, support, and services. The findings we present today are based on an upcoming brief that we will be releasing sometime next month, so you can read the full text there. Here is the agenda for today's webinar. We'll start with some background information on the special health care needs population. We'll go over the purpose of our analyses and the webinar. We'll provide a brief overview of the methodology. And then we'll dig into some national and state level findings from our analyses. We'll also present some conclusions. And at the end, we'll have some time for discussion and questions. If you have any comments or questions during the presentation, please feel free to leave them in the question box and we can loop back to them at the end. I believe Fudumo just sent out um, a chat to the entire audience, so you can find that box there. So to begin, here's some brief history on the growing recognition of children with disabilities in America in the past 40 to 45 years. Two key events in history to point out are the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA for short. And this was formally known as the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. The other um, key event to point out is Americans with Disability Act in 1990. And in response to these legislations, there have been multiple data sources about this population. So some key ones we have here are the U.S. Census Bureau questions as part of the American Community Survey, the National Survey of Children with Special Health Care Needs in 2001, and the National Survey of Children's Health, which was first fielded in 2003. As of 2016, the Special Health Care Needs Survey and the National Survey of Children's Health have been merged together to form the revised NSDH, which we'll be talking about today. And additionally, Additionally, this is not on the slide, but I just wanted to point out that the Department of Education also regularly publishes data on this population as part of the IDEA. It is restricted to school age children. As you can see, and based on the multiple data sources that we went over in the previous slide, there are different approaches in how people define this population. For example, the IDEA outlines specific categories of disability, and the National Health Interview Survey focuses on the concept of activity limitation. The NSDH, which is the survey that we use for today's webinar, lists 18 specific health issues to which parents can respond to. I wanted to point out here that the categories under IDEA and NSDH do not perfectly align with each other, but there is quite some overlap. The U.S. Maternal and Child Health Bureau provides a comprehensive definition for this, this population of children and youth with special health care needs. They define them as those who have or are at increased risk for a chronic physical, developmental, behavioral, or emotional condition, and who also require health and related services of a type or amount beyond that required by children generally. And this is the definition that we have chosen to use for our webinar today as we have conducted our analyses. Here we just highlight some findings from existing literature on the quality of life for this population. Just to clarify, um, these are not from our analyses. We haven't gotten there yet, but we have looked into previous literature. So, for example, parents of children and youth with special health care needs report more frequent medical care for their children, 
and greater need for specialized care. Children and youth with special health care needs also face greater exposure to adverse childhood experiences, and this is actually something that we'll see later today in our findings. In education settings, the literature shows that they face greater risk of disciplinary removal or placement in restrictive settings, academic challenges, behavioral problems, and difficulties with peers, such as bullying. And lastly, families of children and youth with special health care needs experience unique challenges, such as financial stress due to cost of medical care and social isolation. Relatedly, the literature shows that this population experiences disparities in access to and quality of services. So for example, while most children and youth with special health care needs may have access to some sort of health care, only a small portion of them receive all attributes of a high quality health care system. Past research has also shown that health care gaps exist for specific groups in particular such as racial and ethnic minority families, low-income families, and households with a primary language other than English. In comparison to their peers without special health care needs, families of children and youth with special health care needs also report less optimal home, neighborhood, and school environments. And lastly, the literature demonstrates how the state in which a child lives can influence the care and services they receive as we will also see in our data shortly. So the purpose of our analyses and today's webinar is to present descriptive data of children and youth with special health care needs and their families at the national level. We contrast data for the special health care needs population to their peers on various aspects, including access to a medical home, and lastly, we present data for these populations in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. So here is where I will pass it off to Fidumo. Thank you, Deborah, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, over the next few slides, I will provide a quick overview of our uh, brief methodology. And then I will also provide some of the outcomes uh, by some of the characteristics that Deb has already uh, mentioned. I will take a deeper dive, and then um, we will go into the state level um, findings. So for uh, the methodology, um, the data that we used was a 2016-2017 National Survey of Children's Health. Um, this data was conducted in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Um, the sample size that we used um, was for the combined years of 2016 and 2017 for uh, increased accuracy. Um, the survey used household addresses to select randomly um, houses, uh, specific households um, in all states. And then for the analysis, the total sample size was at 71,811. Um, and this uh, 70, almost 72,000 number is a combination of 2016 and 2017. Um, our analyses are weighted to be statistically representative of children at the national and uh, the state level. Um, further, for the um, analysis, we examined um, demographics for both children and their families. Um, the selected demographics for the children include gender, uh, sorry, sex, age, race, race and ethnicity, special health care needs status, um, whether or not they have access to insurance and um, uh, adverse childhood experiences. At the family level, we looked at characteristics like family income level, our reliance on public assistance, family structure, language spoken at home, um, and neighborhood characteristics. Um, so we looked at, we will provide those outcomes and then uh, the next level of analysis that we did was that we controlled for the child's characteristics, um, including age, uh, sex, race, and ethnicity, insurance coverage, family income, family structure, and the language spoken at home. And we used multivariate logistic reg regression to examine the association of, se of several child and family characteristics with the likelihood that a child with special health care needs has a medical home. Um, as we will go over, a medical home is a standard of high quality of care that 
consists of five components. Um, as well, we also looked at the very specific components of a medical home. And so this um, includes access to a personal doctor or nurse, family-centered care, effective care coordination, and accessible healthcare services. Um, so now we will just look at some of the overall national level outcomes um, about the children and youth with special health care needs and how they compare to their peers without special health care needs. Next. So as you can see, um, the prevalence of special health care needs is 19% uh, among the total population. And in this graph, we can see that um, males uh, outnumber girls, uh, females at a much higher uh, proportion. Next. Um, so next we look at the specific uh, health condition conditions. While the NSCH provides information on a much longer list of uh, health conditions, um, in this instance, we just wanted to highlight some of the most prevalent health conditions. Uh, so we see that among uh, children and youth with special health care needs, um, we see that ADD and ADHD as well as asthma um, are some of the highest at 33%, followed by externalizing and internalizing disorders. Uh, for clarity, externalizing disorders um, refer specifically to behavioral or conduct problems, while internalizing disorders is a combination of um, depression and anxiety. And then um, coming in follow, uh, after internalizing disorders, we have learning disability and uh, developmental delay. Next. Okay, so um, now we are going to look at uh, the prevalence of special health care needs um, among uh, children of uh, different uh, race and ethnicity. So the prevalence of special health care needs among um, children and youth with special health care needs uh, also varies by race and ethnicity. So in this instance and uh, presentation, when we refer to ethnicity, we're specifically referring to uh, Hispanic ethnicity. So if we look at the orange bars in this graph, uh, we can see that the distribution of race and ethnicity among uh, the general population, and or rather the total population, which does include those with and without special health care needs. And so, for example, we can see that 4.6% of the total population of children 0 to 17 captured in our, um, in our survey um, are Asian. Similarly, 51.4% are white, non-Hispanic, um, and so on. Um, and now, if you look at the blue striated bars, we can um, see that the racial and um, ethnic variation among children and youth with special health care needs. And so, for example, we can see that 17.8% um, of children and youth with special health care needs are Black, non-Hispanic. Similarly, we can see that among children and youth with special health care needs, 2.4% uh, are Asian. So um, to that end, we can see that it looks like some children are either over or underrepresented um, among those with special health care needs. So for example, we can see that there is an overrepresentation of Black non-Hispanic children, while there is an underrepresentation of uh, Asian um, children. Um, similarly, there's like a slight underrepresentation among uh, Hispanic youth. When we did our analysis, we noted that this uh, um, difference in children and youth with special health care needs and the total population uh, race and ethnic distribution is statistically significant for Black, non-Hispanic, and Asian children. And so while our analysis cannot determine causality, these disparities prompt concern that uh, social determinants may contribute to the prevalence um, of over or under identification of special health care needs among uh, Black, non-Hispanic children and Asian children. Next. Um, another aspect of um, the childhood experience that we looked at was uh, education. We found, um, as you can see here, that children and youth with special health care needs also vary um, from their peers without special health care needs um, in their academic experience. Um, in this in this graph, we can see that in the 
far left uh, set of bars that children and youth with special health care needs repeat grades more often than their peers. Um, in our analysis, we find that the difference between the two groups um, in terms of repeating grades were significant. So that means that children and youth with special health care needs um, statistically significantly repeat grades more often um, than uh, their peers without special health care needs. Uh, similarly, we found that uh, children and youth with special health care needs also miss more school days. So we can see that um, at the bar on the far right side that they miss seven or more um, school days m more frequently compared to children and youth without special health care needs. And this was also a statistically significant finding um, in our analysis. Next. Um, another interesting aspect that we looked at um, for the experience of children and youth with special health care needs is exper um, uh, experience and characteristics was uh, adverse childhood um, experiences. And so we found that um, in addition um, to experiencing um, a harder economic um, outcomes, children and youth with special health care needs were more likely than um, their peers to experience all of the um, factors of ACEs that the NSCH captured. So this includes whether or not a parent or guardian died, whether or not um, uh, there was divorce, they had a hard time covering basics like food or um, housing, um, whether or not they were, um, they were victims of violence or uh, they had an incarcerated parent. And so, um, as you can see, these findings show that the children and youth with special health care needs are indeed more likely to have a parent who's incarcerated, incarcerated, uh, witnessed domestic violence, or have been a victim of violence themselves. Um, they also have a higher rate, um, a higher cumulative number of these adversities. While we don't have this uh, data shown in our analysis and in the brief, you will see that children and youth with special health care needs are more likely than their peers without special health care needs to have um, two or more um, ACEs um, present for them. Next. And then finally, um, just to provide uh, an overview of uh, insurance coverage, an important component of uh, accessing um, service and support. We want to point out that it looks like um, from our analysis, uh, children and youth with special health care needs tended to have um, uh, m access to insurance a little bit more than those without special health care needs. So um, the survey, the NSCH survey asks, is a child currently covered? And so children with special health care needs were likely to be covered. They were also likely to have had insurance in the past uh, 12 months. And um, the numbers also show that they are also more likely to have a gap in coverage, but we didn't find um, the, the difference in whether or not they had um, a gap in coverage to be statistically significant. We did note that um, having insurance in the past uh, 12 months was uh, statistically significant for them. Next. And so in addition to looking at some child level outcomes, we also looked at some family level uh, outcomes. And so comparing uh, the families and environments of children and youth with special health care needs to their peers. And so um, compared to the families of children and youth with special health care needs, um, without special health care needs, those uh, families of children with special health care needs tended to report that they were more likely to be in a single parent household. They were more likely to speak English as a primary language. They were more likely to be um, in lower income and receive uh, assistance from several public uh, benefit programs. Um, and they were less likely to live in neighborhoods that they considered safe and more likely to live in neighborhoods with uh, detracting characteristics. And these detracting characteristics include um, littering, rundown houses, and vandalism. Next. 
Okay. And finally, in addition to understanding the special healthcare needs population demographics and family structures, we also provide an, an analysis and comparison of their access to a medical home. Um, a medical home is a practice model that was established by the American Association of Pediatrics to identify comprehensive and community-based high-quality care. The criteria for a medical home um, include access to a personal doctor, um, as you can see here, family-centered care, effective care coordination, whether or not they have access to referrals when needed, and the usual source for sick care. Um, to qualify as having a medical home, um, a child must receive care that meets the criteria for the first three components. Um, additionally, any child needing referrals or care coordination must meet uh, those two uh, components as well. F finally, family-centered uh, care is a measure of a parent's reported care experience. And so this includes whether or not the medical staff um, uh, spent enough time with them, if they spent enough time um, listening to them, if the parents reported feeling like um, they were sensitive to the family's values and needs and they provided sufficient uh, information and worked with them um, like a partner in the medical planning process. Next. Okay. So in our analysis, um, we adjusted for child and family level uh, level characteristics to determine um, what uh, factors um, contribute to the likelihood that a child would have access to a medical home. So in our analysis, we found that there are some various uh, characteristics that uh, contribute to this or impact whether or not a child has um, access to a medical home um, and specifically to the components of a medical home. Um, and so while the brief will provide more information, I will just touch on each of these um, very quickly. So in our analysis, we found that um, examining the medical home components provided a bigger picture. And so we note, for example, that compared to white non-Hispanic uh, children, black uh, non-Hispanic children uh, were less likely to have access to a personal doctor um, or family-centered care. Um, comparably, Asian children um, were more likely, um, in comparison to white non-Hispanic, to have a personal doctor, um, although, uh, and they were less likely to have problems uh, getting referrals as needed. Um, and finally, Hispanic children uh, were less likely to have a personal doctor and a usual source of sick care. Um, another distinguishing factor was access to insurance. Um, so we found that um, whether or not a child was uh, currently insured um, impacted um, their experience of the medical home components. For example, um, current insurance coverage was associated with greater likelihood of having a personal doctor or nurse a usual, um, and a usual source of sick care. Um, it was also associated with a greater likelihood of uh, problems um, getting referrals. And that just might be, um, while there's no causality, um, as, as we stated earlier, that just might be a matter of need. Because again, refer, getting referrals is for those who need referrals. And then um, children in families with income above the poverty level uh, were more likely to have a personal doctor or nurse or usual source of sick care. And then um, children in families with incomes at least four times the federal poverty level were more likely to have uh, problems also getting referrals as needed. And then uh, finally, when looking at uh, family structure, we noted that um, single compared to um, households or two two married uh, parents, we found that um, family structure was not associated with access to a personal doctor or nurse or getting referrals. However, single mothers were less likely to have effective care coordination or family-centered care. Um, and similarly, we also had a, uh, a category of other family structure um, who were also less likely to have um, access to family-centered care 
and a usual source of sick care. In this instance, other in the NSTH uh, survey refers to foster parents um, and relative or non-relative other guardians or uh, grandparents. However, adoptive parents can, um, is categorized as parents the same way biological parents are. And then finally, um, we just wanted to note that uh, children living in homes where English is the primary language uh, were more likely to have a personal doctor or a nurse and receive family-centered care. Um, next. And that is it for me. I'm now going to turn it over to Deborah. Thank you for Jamal. And now we will jump into some, some state-level findings. First, we looked at the percentage of children and youth with special health care needs across each of the states. I won't go into the numbers for every state, but wanted to point out that the darker shading of the boxes indicate higher percentages. So as you can see here, the prevalence of special health care needs among children and youth overall varies considerably by state, with a high of 24% in Kentucky, Mississippi, and West Virginia, which are circled here in yellow on the map, and to a low of 13% in Hawaii, which is circled the red. And we will be sure to send out these slides after the webinar in case you are interested in finding your own state. For school-age children, that is ages 6 to 17, the NSCH also gathers information on whether a child ever received an individualized family service plan or individualized education plan, both of which we call here a special education plan. The same thing with this figure, the darker shading indicates higher percentages. And there is quite a lot of variance across the state. So in New York, almost half of the children in youth with special health care needs in the state receive a specialized education plan, while only 19% of them do in Texas and Iowa. While we have not determined the cause of this variance, it may reflect differences in state education policies. For example, the low numbers in Texas may be associated with a policy that was implemented around 2004 that limited the number of children receiving special education and related services in that state. So it would be interesting to explore the different policies by state which are influencing these numbers. Here we have the percentages of children and youth with special health care needs who receive a special education plan by their different health conditions. So we've provided just a few examples to illustrate our point. As you can see, there's a large difference in the percentage of children with ADHD who receive a special education plan. This ranges from 64% in the District of Columbia to 19% in Texas. And there is an even bigger gap for children with internalizing disorders, with 57% of them receiving a plan in New Mexico and only 7% of them in Mississippi. So these numbers just demonstrate the disparities among states and how they treat children with the same condition. The figure here shows us the percentage of children and youth with special health care needs who have access to a medical home, which Fuduma laid out for us before. As you can see, there is a substantial difference between certain states, again, with the darker boxes indicating higher percentages. In the state of Nebraska, circled here in yellow, 57% of children and youth with special health care needs across the state have access to a medical home. Meanwhile, only 30% of them do in Nevada, which is circled here in red. Again, I know we're just zipping by these numbers pretty quickly today, but feel free to take a closer look at these after receiving the slides. This map here presents the difference in access to medical home between children and youth without special health care needs and children and youth with special health care needs. In other words, if you look at this box on the left, we subtracted the percentages for the children and youth with special health care needs population from the percentages of their peers without special health care needs, which is why you'll see some negative numbers here. 
Those indicate states where more children and youth with special health care needs have access to a medical home than their peers. I do want to point out here that not, not all differences were significant, but we can talk about those that were significant. Despite the considerable needs and challenges of the special health care needs population, we see that there is only one state, which is highlighted here in purple, um, that is Delaware, where significantly more children and youth with special health care needs have access to a medical home than their peers without special health care needs. Meanwhile, there are eight states where significantly more children and youth without special health care needs have access to a medical home than those with special health care needs. So those are circled here in yellow. And those states are Florida, Iowa, Maryland, Massachusetts, Nebraska, Nevada, New Hampshire, and New Jersey. But it is very surprising that there is only one state where children and youth with special health care needs have access to a medical home than their peers. And lastly, we looked at insurance coverage for these two populations by state. We don't have a map here, but some key high-level findings. Um, rates of insurance coverage over the past 12 months for children and youth with special health care needs ranged from 99% in California to 87% in Arkansas. Up to 10% of children and youth with special health care needs in Arkansas experienced a gap in insurance coverage over the past 12 months and up to 9% in Alabama had no coverage at all in the past 12 months. So based on the national and state level data that we presented today, we just wanted to leave you with a few key takeaways. Children and youth with special health care needs as a group face more adversities and challenges in school than children and youth without special health care needs, as we saw today at the NAP through the national level findings. Children and youth with special health care needs also encounter challenges in accessing appropriate, comprehensive, and coordinated care, as we saw through the medical home variable. Overrepresentation of black children and youth among ch children and youth with special health care needs may reflect in part the consequences of racial and ethnic prejudice and socioeconomic inequality. Again, we haven't caused we haven't tested for causation, but these are some speculations, and we would be interested to learn more about why there might be over or under representation of some race ethnicities. And lastly, according to the state level data, we can see that the experiences of children in need with special health care needs and those without special health care needs appear to differ substantially depending on the state in which they live. So now we would like to open it up for questions um, and some discussion points. I believe we received some questions through the chat box. Hi. Yes. We, so we have a few questions that were um, coming in. I think some are kind of very quickly can be answered. I think also thank you for those of you who are asking questions. Um, the last question we received was um, from Shu Fang, and I'm, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, asking if ADD, ADHD is defined as a, the one diagnosed by physicians. This is correct. So the conditions that the NSCH covers does um, ask that the parent responders um, if the child has been diagnosed by a doctor. So uh, all these conditions um, are based on whether or not a child has been diagnosed by a doctor. Oh. Um, there are quite a few. So I'm just going to start up now. Um, so, Caitlin asked for the prevalence of special healthcare needs broken down for race and ethnicity. I am wondering if. It is not more diagnosed for communities of color because medical professionals are not believing um, parents of color. Um, I would like for everybody to chime in so that they can. But we, um, what we found in the literature 
show that there are over and under representation. Um, so uh, sometimes there is an over diagnosis um, in communities of color and sometimes there is an under diagnosis um, in communities of color. Um, but that is what the literature reflects. Um, I think another Caitlin asked, why are some races over identified? Um, I, I think you are referring to the slide um, that I was discussing that was showing the overall population and the population among special healthcare needs youth. Um, and that is, um, I, I believe, what, what, what we were just discussing, that um, there is uh, an over and under diagnosis um, issue in some communities of color. Um, let me see. And Deborah and um, David, please feel free to chime in if you can add more. Um, let me see. So the other question is, what is the advantage of using the National Health Survey um, instead of the Nat instead of the Children with Special Health Care Needs Survey? Uh, historically, they were two separate um, surveys. However, as of 2016, the two surveys have been combined into one. So all the questions that were covered in the special um, in the Children with Special Health Care Needs Survey are now in the uh, special um, in the National Survey of Children's um, Health Survey. So, so the questions have not been uh, combined. Um, next, is it possible to know which families have more than one child with special health care needs? So these surveys, um, the so the surveys ask um, screeners about um, all the children in uh, the family. Um, and then based on age and special health care needs status, one child is selected from each uh, family. So to my knowledge, I don't believe that the survey has any information on uh, siblings. Um, there's another question asking the distribution of uh, conditions stratified by the children with special health needs. I do not have that information off the top of my head to share, but I am happy to flag this question and um, include it in our uh, post webinar follow up so we can provide a bit more information with that uh, to explore the uh, data itself. Um, if you just wanted to look at some general descriptives, um, the child, I think it's childhealth.org, that the data's website, um, the CAMI hosts the data, so on that website, you will be able to look at um, specific conditions and their distribution in the general population. All right, this is, uh, this is David Murphy, a uh, colleague of Kudumo uh, and uh, Deborah, and it, while the National Survey of Children's Health is a terrific resource uh, on this topic and many others, um you you may be aware already that that when you start um uh taking a subgroup like children with special health care needs and breaking it down into into multiple uh further subgroups by uh by either health condition or health condition plus race and ethnicity for example um you start running into some problems with small sample uh numbers um and therefore those data can't always be relied upon to be accurate estimates so unfortunately uh uh given given the specialized population um there's a limit to how much slicing and dicing if you will we can do with the data before we run into that problem of simply uh inadequate sample sizes but it, it, it's an important question and it may be that when we amass more years of data um, from this survey we can uh, combine data years and and uh, produce more reliable estimates um, on that basis excellent thank you david um the next question we have is to understand more about their care, do you have any suggestions about what data sets 
needs to be linked and is it possible to have linked data? Um, so as David was saying, the, the National uh, Survey of Children's Heads website does provide archived data. I don't believe you can link the older iterations of the survey, um, the pre-2016 iterations of the survey to anything current. Um, what the site does um, and what you can do when you request data from the website is um, combined years. So um, you can look at data for the outcomes over the years. Um, however, it would be worth noting that um, the pre-2016 and pre-2017 uh, 2017 and post-2017 16 uh, surveys um, ask a different set of questions. I can't think of other data sets you might want to explore, um, but to my knowledge, I believe this, this provides quite a comprehensive list. Um, and let me just clarify, uh, in case there's any, any doubt on this point, that um, the National Survey of Children's Health is a, uh, uh, a cross-sectional um, survey. It's not longitudinal, so it does not follow individual children from year to year. So, um, uh, for instance, the children that are part of the 2016 sample are, are not the same children who are part of the 2017 sample. Um, so it is not a survey, it is not a data source that can help us track uh, children or their caregivers over time, uh, but it can provide a snapshot of multiple, um, uh, over multiple years to help us understand whether conditions in general for this group and their families are getting better or staying about the same or, 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 or getting worse. So I, I just, just wanted to clarify that uh, this is a snap, these are snapshots, these are not uh, longitudinal data. Right, thank you, David. Uh, the next question is, um, let's see, so Christine, who wants to know if we will be sent the PowerPoints? Yes, we are happy to share the PowerPoints um, in our follow-up after the webinar. So thank you all for participating and asking questions. Um, let's see, Sandra asked, did you measure the incidence of allergies broadly and food allergies specifically? We did not include that in our brief. Um, however, um, in our follow-up, also happy to uh, flag this question and share the prevalence um, that we that is present in the 2016 and 2017 um, data. Um, have you noticed if Part C or Part B agencies are short staffed to initially screen children? Ah, that's a question from Carol, and she left. Um, so this was not in the purview of our analysis. Uh, this was also not information that um, was captured in, in the survey to the extent of my knowledge. So we couldn't um, answer that question. Um, is there, so Amy wanted to know if there's an interest in replicating this approach uh, with reference to dental homes instead. Uh, we don't have any current plans to do though to do that. Um, however, of course, we encourage and would find that also um, an interesting brief um, an analysis to look at. The survey data does provide information about um, oral uh, health and dental health, um, in addition to child-level characteristics, I believe there are some national measures, um, uh, performance, uh, performance measures and outcomes that are also relevant to um, oral health uh, for children. Um, yep, yep, there, so there's um, a comment that it looks like the analysis can be done using the survey data. That is exactly what we did. We we requested um, the data from CAMI, who hosts the data, and we just conducted our analysis using the combined 2016-2017 data. Um, there's another question. Is autism considered a developmental delay or externalizing issue when there is a behavior component? Um, also, can you speak a little more about access for families to receive support, to medical support? So I can tackle the first part of that question and um, maybe ask for David to um, 
chime in on the second one, but so um, in the prevalence that we presented, um, you might have noticed that those numbers definitely would add up to over 100. So while the questions are set up in such a way that parents are asked, has the child been diagnosed with this? They also ask if a child has presented any behavioral or um, developmental or cognitive issues over the past 12 months. And so it is likely that a child who is um, uh, considered as having autism might also have externalizing um, uh, issues. So there would probably be an overlap um, in the counts um, so that a child can have autism and externalizing issues. Um, also about um, accessing support for families beyond medical support. Um, because the focus was essentially the medical home, um, I can't confidently speak to that as I don't believe the data um, goes up beyond um, things like family-centered care or the care coordination. Um, David, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, well, once again, um, the National Survey of Children's Health, our here is a very rich source. And while we didn't, uh, we couldn't, <laughs> no one can include in a single study all the possible uh, variables. Um, there, there is an item in that survey which asks parent, asks the parent uh, whether uh, there are people that they can turn to for specific. Uh, uh, I believe it's emotional support primarily uh, with with parenting and uh, ask them to list you know, the type of person who it might be. So a pastor or a rabbi or a priest uh, versus a neighbor versus uh, um, other other uh, types of individuals. So um, I would encourage you to explore uh, the, the website that Fudumo mentioned. It's uh, the shorthand title is childhealthdata.org. Um, and uh, that is one of the variables we we weren't able to include uh, that in our analysis for this project, uh, but um, it would certainly be an interesting one to explore uh, and to to, to, to contrast uh, the special health needs uh, population with um, with the population without special health needs and see if in fact uh, their uh, sources of support might might be different and or. Uh, or, or whether families are able to, you know, answer affirmatively to uh, getting that kind of support in general. Um, so, um, sounds like something uh, something people should pursue certainly. Thank you. Um, so, just a few minutes ago, Libby asked, "Do you have data based on age groups, for example, infants and toddlers, and type of special?" Uh, how can I need? Yes. Um, the survey data, um, when it is cleaned, does group children into um, um, into categories, into age categories, and so they have uh, three and five age categories. Um, so this is something that you can explore on the child health data uh, website. Um, I think it might be helpful since there are so many questions about the data itself. Uh, if we share. Um, a webinar that we did maybe two weeks ago, uh, a little under two weeks ago, that, that is also um, showing how to navigate that. So I think if you just go to the website and try to, um, there's a navigation option for it, uh, you can look at special health care needs status and then further break it down by age categories and race and um, income level and um, all that sort of information. Um, there are a few other questions about, uh, let's see. Do you think Medicaid data is a good one to analyze children with special health care needs? Um, again, my knowledge in that is limited as we didn't use um, Medicaid data and I'm not uh, very familiar with the Medicaid data. I think my knowledge of Medicaid data is um, limited to the fact that there was recently updated um, information available for the Medicaid data. Uh, any thoughts, David? Are you familiar with the Medicaid data? You know, I've I've not heard any reports, uh, favorable or otherwise, uh, favorable or not favorable, uh, about Medicaid data specifically about children with special health care needs, um, and I haven't explored it personally. Um, it, it is, it is a, in general, uh, a great data resource 
obviously on a on a sizable percentage of uh, children in the United States. Certainly not not all, but um, so yeah, I I'm, I'm not able to to, to speak to its uh, specific utility work when it comes to children with special health care needs, but uh, um, perhaps there are others who are more familiar that, than I on that point. Mm -hmm. um, finally, I think um, two other similar questions that seemed specific. Perhaps to Medicaid data, can we find any ICD-9 or ICD-10 codes defined by um, CDC or government to identify disease insurance claim data. Um, so the NSCH data does not have that information to my knowledge. I think if you believe that these codes are um, tracked or maybe um, determined by the CDC, the CDC might be a better source of information. I think there's also another question about um, uh, tracking children's birth defects for birth to death in a longitudinal data set. Uh, again, because the NSDH data is not longitudinal, um, I could not speak to that. However, maybe the CDC's data sets that they collect, uh, yeah, I, maybe that's like a CDC or a Medicaid uh, question. I can, however, tell you with confidence that the NSDH does not have this data. Yeah, so keep in, keep in mind uh, that the National Survey of Children's Health um, is uh, it, all of the uh, uh, responses to that are made by parents or, or the most knowledgeable caregiver in the household. Um, so parents are, are in general an excellent uh, source of information about their children, but uh, this is not a group that's going to know necessarily the ICD-9 or the ICD-10 codes. That, that kind of thing. So, um, and these are, of course, these are not claims data. So, uh, it's important with any data set to keep in mind what its limitations are as well as what its uh, strengths are. Um, and the NSCH uh, is is uh, is no exception. Thank you, everyone, and David for for helping you feel these questions. These are some really great questions. Yeah, thank you, Shufan, for all your questions. They were some really thoughtful uh, questions. Um, if, yep, yep, I was about to ask Deborah to go to the last page. Uh, so here are our emails. You are welcome to reach out to us if you can think of any more questions. We will do our best to collect these questions, provide answers, um, and in our follow-up also share the slides from our presentation. Do you have and any more? Just as one last reminder that um, these findings are based on a full brief that we'll be releasing sometime next month, so you can keep your eyes out for that. Thank you everyone uh, for your interest in, in this work at Child Trends, and thanks to the Annie E. Casey Foundation for funding this work. Uh, and I hope for those of you who uh, weren't so familiar with uh, the National Survey of Children's Health that this will whet your appetite for taking a closer look at that resource, at, as well as uh, taking a closer look at what Child Trends has to offer. We we, we publish a, a lot of uh, a lot of information free of charge, so um, check out our website.